I am Lawrence Chuno, and this is Doing Jazz. Hello everyone and welcome to Doing Jazz. My name is Lawrence Chuno and this episode is with pianist and composer Harold O'Neill. In addition to being an accomplished jazz pianist, Harold is also an important musical voice in the pop and hip-hop community. Harold has worked with Jay-Z and U2 and has contributed to contents on HBO, Disney and MTV just to mention a few. Harold O'Neill's latest release is a solo piano album titled Piano Cinema, a distinctively curated collection of solo piano songs. These songs highlight Harold's excellent piano skills while taking you on a subtle filmic journey. The song playing in the background is titled Scenes from a Dream. During my conversation with Harold, you'll hear the songs Painting in D and Sam and Sam. Towards the end of the conversation, you'll hear the song, The Magic Hour. These songs are all from the album, Piano Cinema, by Harold O'Neill. After listening to this episode, you can learn more about Harold O'Neill by going to the website of the show, www.doingjazz.net. You can listen to more episodes of Doing Jazz by subscribing on iTunes, Spotify, or any of the available podcast vendors. If you are on Spotify, please check out a cool playlist I curate. It's called the Doing Jazz Playlist. It's a one-stop playlist for songs by all the Doing Jazz guests so far. While on iTunes, please rate the show, leave a comment, and share the show with your loved ones. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I present Harold O'Neill in your face. <laughs> Harold O'Neill, welcome to Doing Jazz. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. The last time we were talking, you were telling me about your album release event, party. Mm -hmm. That was yesterday, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I had my album launch event yeah. held at the SAP Next Gen headquarters, mm -hmm. headquarters of SAP. A uh, big multinational software company. Nice. Uh, they're basically what Google is to information, what GE is to electricity, mm -hmm. SAP is that to software. Mm. So I have a residency there uh, curating a series of events linked to the U the United Nations Global Goals. Nice. And uh, my album event was the kickoff mm. of that series. That's awesome. Yeah, you invited me. Unfortunately, I had a gig yesterday. I had a small gig at Shrine. I'm sure you know where Shrine is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's uptown. <laughs> so you have this new project that mm. we're going to talk about. But before we talk about it, I want to talk about a few other things that I don't want to forget. Sure. <laughs> I, was, I was looking you up, researching you, and I saw you've worked with a lot of people in the industry and the the people you've worked with it's like a diverse collection of 
human beings in the industry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like you've worked with Jay-Z, you've worked with Disney, yeah. uh, human beings and corporations. <laughs> right. You've worked with uh, with uh, HBO. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're, uh, you're kind of everywhere, but you're a jazz musician. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about how that came about and if you've had any particular experience, professional experience that you can you really think is very mo- memorable you want to share with me share with us yeah sure so you know each of those things you've mentioned they're pretty different pretty diverse mm-hmm. and uh the piano my work as a musician that way is the center of all of those things so mm-hmm. for example the uh the thing i worked on with jay-z was uh being featured as an artist in his music video for uh forever young Mm. well young forever is what it's called and uh that was like an acting gig and uh yeah and uh disney that was composing music for um i was brought in to do some things uh towards the end of uh Tomorrowland, this film that they put out mm-hmm. some time ago. HBO was another acting thing that was with uh, Steve Buscemi and Michael K. Williams in Boardwalk Empire. As far as uh, how the, these things come about, you know, I've always been an outgoing person and I've always been a curious person. Uh, my grandma is a great, <laughs> great big piece of the blame for that, about how mm-hmm. that came to be. Nice. But, um, you know, she always took me around everywhere. And, you know, she'd always bring me along with her for her senior citizens events. I'd be the only kid there. Mm. But they would always go around trying different things, like trying tennis, trying golf, swimming horseback riding nice (laughs) and she always told me you can explore and do whatever you want in the world so that kind of just stuck with me as an adult oh awesome uh you were asking about uh like a memorable uh, memorable event yes so uh a few years ago i had the opportunity to uh perform and share the stage with you too and uh and um a really great lineup of various artists but uh u2 was the head were the headliners yeah and uh this was an event for amnesty international we uh did a dvd together it was Mm. live television broadcast in multiple countries and the name of that project is electric is called electric burma Mm. the name of that project is electric burma yeah that's what it's called nice yeah nice awesome awesome uh amon's all the things you just talked about, the YouTube one sounds really memorable, but there's something I also just uh, wanted to touch up on that um, I think it's something that's kind of um, uh, in- inspiring and maybe um, noteworthy is that when, when it comes to acting and they want a musician... They usually want a real musician. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you you got some acting gigs and you got it because you're a real musician. And exactly. they want you to play as a real musician who is mm-hmm. also an actor. So I really like that. That should be encouraging to, <laughs> to musicians to just yeah. keep doing what you're doing because it's going to find its its way to other, other places in the arts. <laughs> yeah. Right. And that, yeah, as far as, you know, other places in the arts that makes me think about how while it is good to expand what it is that you're doing as an artist Mm -hmm. i would say one of the key elements is and maybe even greater than that is Mm -hmm. not just expanding what you're doing but expanding the range that your brand can cover oh nice a lot of times artists are thinking they have to constantly reinvent themselves Mm. i gotta do something different i have to figure out how to do something different this time Mm -hmm. and that's great too but oftentimes it's seeing how can i take what i do as an artist and expand the platform that Mm. my brand exists in yeah nice yeah nice nice so yeah you know um yeah, that's so it. like yeah. uh, would an example be maybe if um, I'm trying to to say it in such a way that other musicians, maybe somebody who is not as established as you, mm-hmm. uh, maybe 
a musician who is a jazz musician to not just think that, oh, I have to play this different kind of jazz, but maybe solidify my skill and be open to playing in hip hop and other other kinds of music? Is that would that be well i say you know as far as how that expansion works mm -hmm. i think one thing that can help with the sanity inside is staying connected to your heart about mm -hmm. it so okay. there's you know we all put in the time put in the hours practice over and over again and develop our highly refined skill mm -hmm. on that path of insight and discipline mm -hmm. so if that's established then that makes this part a lot easier yeah so you have this uh thing that you do that's your unique sound mm -hmm. and if you're being genuine with yourself if it's your true unique sound then you're yeah. going to be the best person at it Nice. There's not going to be anyone else that can be you better okay. than you be yourself. I see. I so get when it. that so when that's together, yeah. About as far as you know, expanding that. So mm -hmm. it, it especially with jazz uh, or classical music or these fine arts. Mm -hmm. I see these fine arts like fine wine mm -hmm. or fine automobiles. Mm -hmm. So like fine wine, for example, really expensive very high quality wine it's aged uh very refined uh and takes a long time to produce and mm -hmm. very high quality mm. and sometimes hard to find mm -hmm. very rare but most people do not drink fine wine mm -hmm. every single day mm -hmm. a lot of people just like their wine coolers and mm -hmm. their cheap 40 ounce beers or whatever it is they're box wine drink. <laughs> boxed wine you know so then you have to do research and find out because there is a great market for it. It's greatly respected. But I think a lot of fr frustration that artists have is that they're limiting their playing field. Mm -hmm. And they're thinking that maybe I have to play a different genre oh, of music. And maybe that will work. Mm -hmm, maybe that mm -hmm. will work if that's how you feel. Mm -hmm. Me, I'm, I'm open to other genres. So yeah. I'm all over the place. But it's not necessarily, what I'm saying is not necessarily about having to play a different genre mm. but expanding where your unique sound I can see. fit in and that's okay. more about you as a person yes yes right? i see i see i yeah. see yeah find where because you know there are, yeah there's a market for the fine expensive mm -hmm. wine mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of exclusive you yeah. have to know how to network and yeah. develop your brand and Makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. Makes per makes sense. Thanks for the explanation. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And um talking about fine wine Mm -hmm. uh fine art mm -hmm. <laughs> your yeah. album your latest album falls mm -hmm. in that category well thank you so much yes thank it's you. like well done it's uh you see the amount of time that has been put into it and it's uh i would say it's a very bold and challenging project that takes somebody who really trusts himself mm -hmm. and who, who is really confident uh, to just say, go and record 10 tracks or nine tracks, is nine, it tracks. nine tracks yeah, of yeah, solo yeah. piano mm -hmm. that grooves when it wants to groove and it, the left hand is in pocket with the right hand. That's all I, I'm here. And I just, hey. I just, I just really like it. So I want to talk about it. I want to start with, sure. um, because like you said, listening to it, I enjoyed it. But at the same time, I know, I know a, 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 a bunch of people that will enjoy it. But at the same time, I know that some people that will say, this is not for me, you know, right. solo piano sure. is not for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I want to hear it in a movie or something. Right. You know? So, mm -hmm. um, if you can talk about it, maybe start by talking about the theme or why you chose to do this project that is quite different, you know? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So my, the solo piano album, uh, that came out before this one, Marvelous mm -hmm. Fantasy, I had about a one week notice, maybe 10 days notice about the recording session. Mm -hmm. And uh, for this album, I wanted to take more time to refine the sound. Because, you know, just like 
many artists when you're done with the project and you go back and listen to it you're sometimes you're like oh i could have done this better i could have done that better oh mm -hmm. my god this and that and and the fans love it but you're you know i i can be very hard on myself sometimes and that inspires me and motivates me so i said i want to take more time in producing this album mm -hmm. so the concept well the concept so I'm classically trained, mm -hmm. and uh, my favorite composers are uh, Maurice Ravel, Gershwin, uh, Duke Ellington, who's not necessarily classical, but of the same time period-ish. Mm -hmm. And uh, But when I started playing piano, I was really into Liszt and Chopin. Mm -hmm. And uh, in doing this project, this sound of solo piano, uh, I figured that if those guys were still around now they would keep con they would continue to compose solo piano work mm. and there are many 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 marvelous concert solo pianists who have the repertoire mm -hmm. of the classical musician an amazing work absolutely amazing and what i'm talking about though is a different thing mm -hmm. the virtuoso solo piano composer mm -hmm. and performer I believe that that is, there are a few out there who are pushing it, yeah. a few, but not many. Mm -hmm. And uh, I feel that every pianist out there, uh, especially in jazz, has this inner great solo piano composer mm -hmm. that's not being let out. Hmm. And I feel that it's a duty for us piano players to re-embrace that, mm. to take that on, to take on that challenge. It's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So my personal journey in discovering what I'm in, my, the, the depths of my inspiration, uh, I found that uh, it was the sound of film, mm. the sound of Hollywood, the mm -hmm. sound of Broadway, Tom and Jerry, Looney Tunes. Mm. Uh, this is Disney. This is where I found my first inspiration for music. So that kind of cinematic sound is all over the album and about expanding the brand. So, you know, people will say, oh, this sound is not for me. Some, say, for example, someone says, oh, this sound is not for me. This, I'm not into this kind of solo piano thing. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I say, oh, that's okay, no problem. Cool, yeah. you can be whatever in, into whatever you want to be into. But if I'm thinking about expanding my brand, I want to show them yeah. that they're already into it and they don't know. They don't know. <laughs> so I say, well, you like uh, films? Well, yeah. Mm. Not every film, right? No, yeah. no. But do you like, you have certain movies that you like. He's like, yeah. And how do you feel about the music in those films? Mm. And They'll, they'll probably say they love that music. Mm -hmm. So that's part of the, I guess, uh, branding. Yeah. Or, yeah. But the branding is secondary. Yeah. yeah. It's important, but you know, the, that's like the creative. That's, so the way, I, the way I fix that is by mm -hmm. saying that this is how I make it accessible mm -hmm. to connect to the world so that everybody from around the world has a place to, to connect to this album if they want to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So an easy way for the average person, the everyday person, or someone who's not into this, may, that for an easy way for them to be to access this album and connect to it is through the sound of film, yeah. the sound of cinema. Nice, nice, yeah. nice. Um, you, you just... I hope I'm giving you the uh, information course. you're wanting. Yeah, it's... I don't want you to give me the information I want. Okay, <laughs> I want you right. to give me the information the truth, that you're right? supposed to. <laughs> yeah, the truth. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I'm <laughs> I'm learning a lot, and I'm I'm certain things you say I gravitate to it. Like you just mentioned that um, every jazz pianist, like real pianists, have. I'm sorry to use the word real, but. I'm right. comparing them to myself. I play the piano, but I wouldn't call myself just pianist. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. I play I play the standards and all those things, but I I wouldn't let anybody hire me for a gig. So I'm just like people who are like professional working pianists. Um, you, you love it? Yeah, I love it. It's the most yeah. important thing. Yes. Yeah, people you. that are, you know, <laughs> real. There are people that yeah. are quote unquote real pianists out yeah. there, but they've lost their love, mm, you know? So. Interesting. There are people yeah. who have careers and who are hired and, mm -hmm. you know, but they, they don't have, they forgot about that initial connection. I see. So I, see. I think that's the most important thing. Yeah. But anyway, you yeah. were saying. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, it's connected to what you just said. You said that they all have this, um, 
I don't know how you put it, but I'll just put it in my own way. Mm-hmm. In a in a ability to still put out a a a, a a solo piano concert or a solo piano performance and still play a really great solo piano piece. But you say that, as we see, it doesn't happen that often. Why do you think that's the case? I think that, um, well, hmm, I think a couple of things. One, it may just be the natural tide the natural tide of the sea of sound Mm -hmm. where we are you know the wave recedes sometimes the water goes away and then it comes back in and there's a natural flow so you know there is this uh incredible amount of concert pianist Mm -hmm. that have the amazing repertoire that can play everything in the classical songbook but it wasn't always that way Mm -hmm. It, it wasn't always that way and i think uh technological uh, breakthroughs made a difference in that. You know, it's easier for people to travel. It's easier for people to document sound and hear, you know, uh, many interpretations of one classical piece. Uh, And now that's one answer to it. Another answer is that some people are just intimidated by it. Maybe that's part of the natural flow. This is the time Mm -hmm. we're in. But some people are just, uh, you know, intimidated about it about it i mean i was in making this album um you know there was a lot of pressure i had on myself about this because mm-hmm. you know there is a lot of vulnerability in being a solo instrumentalist yeah there's a lot of vulnerability a lot of exposure and uh you're kind of burying yourself exposing yourself out there mm-hmm. so i feel that the criticism can hit harder yeah you know, there because you don't have the rest of the band mm-hmm. to hide behind. <laughs> you you can say with the rest of the band, you can say it wasn't me; it was the bass player. I should have got a different yeah. bass player for this gig or this project. Or it wasn't the bass; yeah. it was the drummer. Man, yeah. he was way off. He was off beat. He's supposed to be on beat. This man was off beat. Man, what's the matter with this guy? You know. Yeah. But if it's just you and your solo, man, they're like, like no, it's man, like they're it's talking too. about your naked body. Yeah. You know, and they say, well, his toes, they kind of. <laughs> He's got his toes kind of separate in the bottom. The rest of his body's fine, yeah. but his toes, and you're like, man, those are my feet, man. What are you talking about my feet for? You know, so it's, in, it's intimidating. It's, yeah. it's hard. But I encourage every jazz pianist, and not just jazz, but, but every jazz pianist, I mm-hmm. say, you know, dive in there and explore your solo piano sound set the bar higher even if no one else hears it do that for yourself and expand your technique Mm. take it to that virtuoso level Mm. have each hand be equal to Mm. the other nice nice yeah you'll get a lot from it yeah i know i did great um how long did it take you to make this this well so the album itself the album all in all is an even split of improvisations and pre-worked compositions. Mm. So say, for example, scenes from a dream Mm -hmm. or scenes of a dream. I can't remember what Mm -hmm. I called it. The first track. Yes, the first track. One of my favorite. Thank (laughs) you. I was going to ask you about it. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. so we can, and we can talk about the process for, you know, each okay. of the tracks, yeah. or any of them. Yeah, already, let's yeah, talk yeah. about. Let's start with this one. I want okay. to talk about three of them. Sure. Let's start with this one. What I really like about about this, I might not communicate it well in the technical language. Forgive sure. me. Uh, the beginning motif, the riff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Is <laughs> very. I don't know if you intended to do this, but it's very polyrhythmic. And yes. coming from West Africa. It was just hitting me. Like, I'm just yeah. like, is the, did he intend to do this? Or Absolutely. did he just... Absolutely. Okay. Ding, so, ding, 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 yeah. ding, 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 ding. That's the vibe, you know? Every track has a groove. Mm -hmm. 
so I'm a dancer as well, right? Nice. So I learned a lot about dance mm-hmm. in my body through groove and learned about groove through my body in dance, mm. that two-way street, and realizing how groove, like if you have the groove set yeah. and there's an infinite, I believe an infinite groove. Mm-hmm. And when I say mm. groove, I just mean any type of looping pattern. It can be like asymmetrical. It doesn't have to be completely even, but Mm -hmm. any type of looping rhythmic theme Mm -hmm. that serves as like a talking drum, Mm. right? That communicates. So that's what groove is to me. So our heartbeat. So we all have groove. Yeah. It's natural. Every one of us has a natural groove in our heartbeat. Mm -hmm. So I believe every piece, uh, once we, if you have the groove established and let the groove be the 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 river that your story rides on Mm -hmm. then the story tells itself Mm. the story so with so with scenes uh scenes of a dream scenes Mm. of a dream or from from a dream oh geez oh my goodness so it's funny that i'm mixing up the name because this one yeah was composed years ago okay and it changed so many times and expanded so many times that I just couldn't call it the same name anymore. Mm, I see. So I cha- I've yeah. probably I've changed the name of this one maybe like three or four times. Okay. And the format that I use for this one in the uh, the kind of the compositional format, mm-hmm. I guess you could call it a sweet format, mm. where you have like a, a recurring theme mm. that shows up in many different sections. Mm. And uh, so you'll have the theme at this part of the piano. And then it transitions and then it moves to a different part of the piano. Mm-hmm. And then you have a variation of the theme. Mm-hmm. And then it transitions down to another part of the piano. Mm. And it has a different theme. So you I have see. this story that's developing in this long, sweet format. Yes. Kind of like an epic tale and mm. like a film. Mm. Like yes. a film soundtrack. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Not, so it's not typical A A B A. Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with A A B A, but it's yeah. Not, oh yeah, it's nothing not. wrong at all. And the other th- the other thing about the, the technical part about this one, yeah. Uh, there's uh, the part of the technical theme is that you'll have a variation of the groove on the bottom of the left hand. Mm. And then a variation of the groove on the top of the right hand. I see. And then in the middle between the two hands. The, uh, the right part of the left hand mm-hmm. and the left part of the right hand, where they meet in the middle, mm-hmm. there's a melody in the middle of that mm. with a little groove with its own variation of the groove. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of uh, not only polyrhythm, but polyfunction as yeah. far as the technique of oh. the hand placement and, in, and in independence. Nice, nice. Yeah. Nice, I like that. Another one is Sam and Sam. Oh. Yeah. I yeah. just like the ballad yeah the feel of it i just i mm-hmm. i can't ex- i can't say what i like about this song but i really like it <laughs> sure yeah yeah now this one this this one is a very special song i wrote this song for the woman in my life the mm. woman of my life her name is uh samara okay and this was a song i wor- wrote for her and when she was a kid she had a pet bird Mm. whose name was Sammy. I see. So I wrote this uh, song thinking about her being a young girl with her bird Sam. So oh. that's Sam and awesome. Sam. Awesome. And that's why it has, sort of has like a lullaby mm-hmm. kind of okay. feel to it. Mm-hmm. Very impressionistic. Yeah. Uh, thinking of like Ravel and Debussy, uh, Monet, paintings of Monet. Mm-hmm. And, uh, oh, and Satie, obviously. Mm-hmm. And uh, this one I wanted to have, I wanted, so there's the groove again, Mm -hmm. right? Every song has its own groove, very distinct groove. I wanted them all to be different. Mm -hmm. And uh, this one, um, yeah, this one is just, uh, the form is very straight ahead. The, the, The key to this one was having it be so minimal and, and but also having that be the challenge of mm-hmm. it mm. to use the space and use the silence and every single step had to be very delicate mm. uh, the touch had to be just right there were some takes i've done of this one uh, that i had i just had to do it again because the touch just was not 
right. Mm -hmm. The touch had to be right in that range. Mm -hmm. And for the solo section, uh, at the last minute, for the last take, I decided to do the solos uh, in octaves with the right hand. Yeah, okay. So, hmm. yeah. Nice, mm -hmm. nice. Good. Uh, painting in D mm. is another one I, I really connect with. <laughs> yeah, paintings in D. So that one, I... Uh, so this one kind of leans more towards the, I guess the A section would lean more towards the, uh, the Debussy vibe. Debussy and Duke Ellington. Uh, and a bit of Gershwin in that one too. Mm. And uh, this one, the key here, well, I guess the key to all of the pieces is about the touch. So each one has a certain type of touch that's required to play each piece. So this one is uh, carried by the touch in, in the same way. When I get to the bridge, though, I use a certain type of chords that I love, mm -hmm. certain type of voicings. I call these my Indiana Jones chords. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I call them Indiana Jones chords because they remind me of the sound of music I hear when Indiana Jones is riding on an elephant in India. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. So this type of uh, Spielberg-esque yeah. sound, this grand sound, I wanted to emulate that hmm. and extract that and use that in the, the bridge section of this song. And then that expanded into the solo section. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Mm -hmm. <gasps> nice. Thank you very much for explaining all these things. And sure. <laughs> no problem at it's, all. It, it, it helps. And... As a as a musician myself, as a vocalist, or uh, an artist, mm -hmm. sometimes I forget the importance of of being able to explain your work, you know. <laughs> right. And yeah. you're reminding me of the importance, and I really appreciate it. And I hope that anybody listening out there who is an artist will take note because this is what we we do. We do it because we believe in it. You know, you, you put out this work because you really believe in it. And if you believe in something, you ought to know every part of it. You ought to know the A and the A to the Z of whatever you're putting out there. You got to like know it to the point that that you you anybody that can mention something and you explain to the person, this is why it's done this way. And I really appreciate it. <laughs> All right. Sure. Great. Thank you so much. It, you know, it's. Uh, I really appreciate it when people want to know the process because mm -hmm. I, I want to share it. Some mm -hmm. people keep it a secret. Yeah. You know, they say I gotta keep this a secret. <laughs> keep it a secret. <laughs> and there is a sacred practice about that. You know, mm -hmm. there are things that about the process that, you know, that I don't even tell myself. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. But I'm happy to be here and have the opportunity to share a bit of this process. Thank you. Because like I said, I want to pass it on. Mm -hmm. I hope that this album can be a catalyst in the scene to inspire pianists to put out more solo piano albums of original compositions. Because like yes. I said, every, every one of them out there mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the scene, they all have this inner virtuoso solo pianist mm -hmm. that's waiting to be let out mm -hmm. and let that sound out mm -hmm. dive deep and find that sound you are listening to doing jazz with lawrence chuno the guest on this episode is pianist and composer harold o'neill his new album, Piano Cinema, is available for download and streaming. If you are on Spotify, please check out and follow the Doing Jazz playlist, a one-stop playlist for songs by all the Doing Jazz guests so far. Yeah. All right, Harold, yeah. let's go back to the very beginning. Sure. <laughs> Where are you from? I was born in Kansas City, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Uh no wait oh my god i'm messing up my own story 
<laughs> You're from Kansas City. I understand. I'm from Kansas yeah. City, Missouri, but I was born in Arusha, Tanzania. That's okay. the fir- I'm that's the first time I've ever said that wrong. <laughs> so I was born in Arusha, Tanzania. Grew up in Kansas City. Um, was exposed to music at a really young age. Mm-hmm. Always noodled around at the piano by ear and. Uh, were, you, were, your, were your parents musicians? Did any of them play They music? weren't musicians. No, my mom, being a village girl, though, music mm-hmm. was in, it was a very important part of her life already. Just, okay. I mean, she's from Tanzania. She, she's from Tanzania, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Chaga tribe. That's mm-hmm. our tribe. Uh, and, you know, so their music is part of tradition and mm-hmm. culture, just okay. like, you know, many African cultures uh, out there. You know, so, and my dad just always had an appreciation for music. He played trumpet as a kid in okay. school, but it never got serious. But he always had an appreciation. And, but I found out later in life that my great grandfather mm-hmm. on my father's side was a pianist and composer. Mm. And he played music for, he played music for silent films in Kansas City. Wow. Yeah, so that was another inspiration behind this this whole thing. He's black. He's, yeah. He was black. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I know. Black guy. <laughs> right? That's a tough well, market to make it in back then. That's great. Mm-hmm. Wow. His name was Oliver Harold Pennington. Mm. Uh, Ollie for short. Yeah. Huh. And he had a son named Harold as well, too. Yeah. Ollie, mm-hmm. Oliver Harold Pennington Jr. Hmm. Black history everywhere mm-hmm. that's right <laughs> so uh now you're gonna be curious about your family how did your mother and your father meet so my dad uh was a member of the black panther party okay and he was a captain in the black panther party my uncle founded the kansas city chapter mm-hmm. and uh eventually became leader of the entire organization mm. so my uncle is a former black panther leader yeah. And my dad was a captain in the Black Panther Party. Okay. My uncle is in exile in Tanzania, and my dad decided to go to Tanzania mm. to uh, change his life, to just get out of America mm-hmm. after the civil rights movement. Uh, he found a new, new life there, met my mom there, village girl. And uh, yeah, they mm. fell in love. I was born. And after I was born, I guess that changed things for them. Mm. And um, for that reason and a few others, they decided to come back to America. Mm. And that's how I ended up in Kansas City. Nice. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. It's a good thing I asked. Yeah. <laughs> so much history <laughs> unveiling yeah. itself. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, all right. I have um, at a point I like to ask my guests some philosophical question not necessarily sure. yeah that it's our discussion have been a little bit philosophical <laughs> up to this yeah. point so it's like a, a, a bit of the ground on that end has been covered but i want to ask you this question um sure. are there because your your life the way you are explaining things it kind of anybody the person listening who is not close to um who doesn't know a lot about being an artist would think that you have a seamless life mm-hmm. when it comes to creating you mm-hmm. know but i'm sure that there have been setbacks there have been there are a lot of successes but there have been setbacks there have been failures you know let's call it what they are and um, right. ca- do you care to talk about any setback and how you learned from it and Sure. Yeah. You know, so transition is a part of life. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, on one hand, I could look at it and say, you know, the way I grew up, I had many obstacles and many setbacks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but on the other hand, it's just my story and my particular, I guess, um, the obstacles were opportunities for me to have a deeper connection with myself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I grew up in uh, pretty rough neighborhoods in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, you know, the whole thing, you know, uh, drugs, violence, uh, crime, 
you know, many friends that uh, didn't make it out mm -hmm. of the scene that I grew up in there. Music was a safe haven for me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, lost friends to, to violence before mm -hmm. puberty. Mm -hmm. You know, seeing friends die. You know, not seeing them actually die in person, but having them die and having that happen, you know, before they're f f fully, before they've become adults. Yeah. That's just a very hard thing and nothing can really prepare you, mm -hmm. prepare someone for that. Mm. And, uh, you know, so music, that was one of the reasons I just threw myself into music and just obsessed over it. Uh, because, you know, not only did I see it, I didn't necessarily think of it as a way out or anything like that, because while at the same time it was a hard environment, mm -hmm. I loved my community. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I loved my friends. Um, so it wasn't necessarily something, it wasn't that I saw it as a way out. I gotta mm -hmm. get out. Gotta, mm -hmm. It never really felt like that. But what it did feel like was that. I have a lot of pain and a lot of fear. I'm very scared and don't know what to do. There was one night on my uh, 18th birthday mm. and, uh, you know, I, I was, you know, in a car. Long story short, people thought that me and my friend were someone else because they saw us talking to somebody who they had a disagreement with. And they just they started shooting at the car or the truck we were in, wow. and uh, it hit the uh, passenger. I think it hit the passenger window, mm. and the window shattered, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was in the passenger seat, and ducked right before it happened, mm -hmm. and uh, the bullet hit the chest of my seat. Wow. So that one hand, that was a wake up call. Mm. Like, hey, you you love these people. You love your family, this community. I don't mean my blood family. Mm -hmm. None of that stuff was in my home. Yeah. That was another, that mm -hmm. was a safe haven too. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mm -hmm. it's like you love your friends. You love this scene. There's something you're getting from it that way. But, man, you got to leave this alone. Mm -hmm. You can't. You got to stop. You you got to get away from that. You mm -hmm. got to get away from it. And uh, that was the last time. That was the last time I uh, really went to hang. Mm -hmm. Like uh, hang out in that scene. I was never a street guy. Mm -hmm. Never a street dude or nothing like that. You know, but I used to just, I mean, mm -hmm. I hung out, mm -hmm. I guess is what you'd say. Yeah. And just and had friends that were way into that, yeah. You know, so you know that. I mean, when things like that are going on, and then the next day or next week, you are doing a gig with people who have no idea what mm, that kind of yeah, experience is yeah. like, mm. and you know, they come and pat you on the shoulder and say, "Hey, Harold, how's everything going with you?" <laughs> wow, we're having a great time, Harold. You have to come out to our cookout sometime. <laughs> And you're like, yeah, sure, I'd love to. And you, you know, you want to fit in and be part of that yeah. scene too, mm. you know. But uh, mm. you know, you one, you feel like you can't tell them about what your life. So they ask, yeah. you know, so what did you do last week, you know? And you know, what do you say? Yeah. You tell them that, especially when you're a kid. Yes, that's what yeah. I'm talking about mm -hmm, too. Mm -hmm. As you're developing, you know, what do you know? When from back then, you're thinking, what do I say to them? Do I tell them that? Yeah, I found, you know, some bullet shells in my front yard and uh, there was a police yeah. car chase that ran into the, the front yard, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, we had to, we heard gunshots and we had we were at the dinner table and we had to duck down under the window. So how was your week? You know, so it's like mm. all these things you bottle up inside yeah. that I bottled up inside. And it's heavy. And it's, it's heavy. heavy. And mu mm. music helped a lot with yeah. that. Music, I mean, saved my life. And what you're saying yeah. is, it. sorry to cut you short, but... yeah. No, that's, that's it's, yeah. having to I can live go on in and that. On about it, yeah, yeah, having but, to live in that duality and deal yeah. with that kind of dichotomy—it's yeah. common. 
I mean, it's yeah, your life. It is, it's unique. Yeah. Yours is mm-hmm. unique, but it's so common and it's still going on. And that's what, like, uh, that's what drives people crazy sometimes. That's what drives black black guys crazy. Black men, black young guys growing up or just any person of color, you know, dealing with such trying to like we call we call it code switching you know like yeah. uh, frivolously call it like that but yeah. Yeah. code switching takes a lot of energy it takes a yeah. whole lot of energy it just doesn't yeah. it just doesn't mean hey speak differently when you get to this place it means right. oh i gotta ignore all this part of me i gotta like bottle it up and now put up this new front and do it in a very easy and convincing way you know and i didn't yeah. i didn't grow up in this country and I, mm-hmm. I i don't think i know enough but i've seen a lot and uh, i kind of to a certain extent understand the the experience without fully understanding sure. it yeah so yeah. thank you for sharing you know yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah no problem and yeah. you know that can that can be a, it's a heavy load to bear mm-hmm Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, you can feel when you're going through that at that young age like that, you can feel sometimes feel like an imposter Mm -hmm. or sometimes feel like, oh, I'm being I'm being fake. What would my friends think about this or what would whoever think about this? And that can affect the way we connect to our inner self, our inner life force, Mm -hmm. the way Mm -hmm. we express ourselves. It can affect the way we connect to our power. Yeah. And we can feel like, you know. So, for example, you'll be in a setting where you're obviously different. You're the different person there. Mm -hmm. You're the minority or you're the black person there. Mm -hmm. And um, you can feel, and sometimes people will say to you, what are you, so how did you get here? Mm. And sometimes it can feel like they're saying to you uh, that you don't get to have any power here. Mm. And that you don't have any power. You're here, but you don't have any power. Yeah. And that's something that I dealt with for a long time with myself Mm. until I realized that even though they're saying it, me feeling it and believing it, Mm -hmm. that's something that I do. Mm. So good news is that in order for me to fix that, I don't need them to change what they're doing. I have to change what I'm doing. doing. And then so I send the message to the I learned to send the message to them that you don't decide how much power I have. Yeah, nice. I decide mm-hmm. how much power I have. Mm. Well said. So then, now here, the funny thing about that is that if I really believe that to be true, mm-hmm. then I can't blame them for making me feel powerless. Mm-hmm. Mm. So now I don't get to use that against them. Oh, they're making me, they're saying I don't have power. They're making me, f- now I'm not talking about people t- to, you know, taking advantage of you and things like that. I'm not talking about that. Mm-hmm. I'm talking more about the inner connection yeah. to yourself. Yeah. You know, so so then I say, now here's the opportunity here. So I say to them, you don't get to decide. You're not the one that decides how powerful I feel. Mm-hmm. I decide that. Mm. And I want to know why, I want to know why you think I don't have any power. Yeah. In your actions, yeah. like you do that in your actions. Yeah. Oh, nice, nice. Mm. That's deep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna make. I'm gonna try to like stereotype you. <laughs> sure, <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> and I might be wrong. I think you were. Were you a good student? <laughs> Growing up, I was so I was I was a good student until puberty hit and mm. stress started to hit. Hmm. So when I was a pretty good student, um, in fourth and fifth grade, I was selected to go to like the gifted and talented program at school, okay. like a special school mm-hmm. where like ten or twelve people kids in what like what subjects like all subjects subjects. it was like the entire school because when when i was a kid i you know i always 
tested very well, mm-hmm. like for the like the standardized tests. Yeah. I mean, what do those really mean? But, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but for this, you know, for this test, I had like perfect scores all the time and stuff. Mm-hmm. So it helped me get into like you know these different this uh, special school for gifted and talented kids. But um, junior high school. I think from what I remember, I had to go to a different school because uh, because of the neighborhood I lived in. Mm-hmm. And the school I went to was, well, it was pretty hood and rough. It was, from what I remember, mm-hmm. I might go back and look at it and be like, ah, it wasn't that bad. But I think it was pretty rough and tough. It was a rough and tough school. And then that, got, that combined with the stress and everything yeah. from the upbringings, you know, I wanted ways to escape my stress. Mm-hmm. And one of the ways kids do that to escape, you know, they either get into drugs or alcohol, yeah. which I didn't really do mm-hmm. like at that young of an age. But another thing they'll do, they'll just start acting up mm, yeah. and they'll start performing poorly yeah. in school. So yeah. I went through a phase of that. Mm. Uh, where in school, I would just my grades, it never got like super, super bad. But it got pretty bad where mm-hmm. I would just like intentionally, you know, just start slacking in school, not doing my best. And it was mm-hmm. really just a sign of the stress. Yeah. And some teachers could see it. They're mm-hmm. like, OK, he's a smart kid. Maybe something else is going on. Yeah. You know, and other teachers that didn't know me, they just figured, oh, well, here's another one, mm-hmm. you know. But uh, in high school, that started to turn around. OK. And uh, by the time I graduated high school, I, I was performing pretty well. But I went to a performing arts high school. So most okay. of my classes were music classes. I see. And actually, the academic teachers were so supportive yeah. of, the, of uh, me deciding to be a professional musician mm-hmm. to the point to where they said, I hope, not, and I hope none of my high school classmates get upset about this. Yeah. <laughs> but some of the academic teachers would say, you know what? You're serious about being a professional musician, so don't worry about this class too much. We <laughs> want good. you're gonna go to you're gonna you're gonna where are you going? You're gonna go to school and stuff. I said, yeah, I'm gonna I'm planning on going to school in New York or mm-hmm. go to Berkeley or something like that. And they said, well, if you're serious about this, then you know we understand mm-hmm. or I understand, and you know so I mean still mm-hmm. do the work, yeah. still do the work, but yeah. you know don't worry about it that much. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you went to Berkeley. I went to Berkeley, which yeah. is like a, a conservatory. Yes. Through, okay. Mm-hmm. So you didn't have to worry too much about the academics. Uh, no. Right. Thank anymore. goodness. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> did you write papers in Berkeley? Uh, I did. Okay. Yeah. Every every now and then. Okay. Every now and then. But to tell the truth, but no man, math. <laughs> Yeah, no okay. math, not for real. Okay. Uh, and, you know, towards the end of class, you know what? I don't know if I just got bored yeah. in college or something like that, or my intention was elsewhere. Mm-hmm. But uh, I kind of just started fading out of school. Mm-hmm. And then um, a friend came to visit, my roommate's friend. Mm-hmm. Uh, came to visit from Manhattan School of Music. Okay. Uh, and actually, he's a very well-known uh, trumpet player now, Ambrose Akinmusiri. Mm. He mm. Uh, came by and visited my roommate in mm-hmm. school in, at Berkeley. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm starting to like, lose interest in Berkeley. I'm starting to just lose interest in school. And he said, man, you should... And no offense to Berkeley. Berkeley yeah. was great. But he was like, man, you know, you should... Uh, you should come to Manhattan School of Music, man. That's where I'm going to school, man. It's great up here. You'd love it. And then you probably want to be in New York anyway. I'm like, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's right. He's like, yeah, man, you should do it. You should go for Manhattan School of Music. Mm. So I did. Mm. And I got into MSM and started there the next year. And uh, Ambrose and myself mm. and Tim Green, alto saxophonist, mm-hmm. And Fraser Holland, the bassist, Lee Pearson, uh, drummer, mm-hmm. uh, we formed a group. We were like, that was our group at mm-hmm. Manhattan School of Music. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, but Ambrose was the one that talked me into going yeah, to Manhattan, Manhattan School of okay. Music. Nice. And uh, yeah, we had a, we all yeah. had a wonderful time there. I'd love to Manhattan School of Music. But then the same thing started happening to uh, I think I was just so focused on networking in the scene. Like right before Manhattan School of Music, mm-hmm. I started playing with Bobby Watson, okay. uh, saxophonist, and started yeah. touring with him. Mm. I think I missed like the first week of school at Manhattan School of Music, which they actually, that was great for my resume mm-hmm. going there that I was working with Bobby. But I missed like my first week of school because we had like, uh, 
I was playing for a festival in Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I gradually just, I mean, I was in Manhattan School of Music full time, but I, towards the end, I started to kind of fade away from school again. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met Andrew Hill, who came to uh, one of the uh, late great American jazz composers. Yeah. Uh, he came to Manhattan School of Music to give a workshop, a master class, and I got in touch with him. We stayed connected, and he said he wanted me to be his apprentice. Mm. So Andrew and I spent time together, and he eventually recommended me to Greg Osby, which was like my, that was my first major label debut as a mm. jazz musician. I was like 20 years old. Yeah, I was 20, 21, 20, somewhere around there. Yeah. And he put me on his album, St. Louis Shoes, mm -hmm. with uh, Nicholas Payton, wow. uh, Bob Hurst, uh, Robert Hurst, and Rodney Green. And uh, yeah, I mm. started working with Greg at the same time, working with Bobby too. Mm -hmm. And uh, all that stuff started kind of taking off. That was like my break, doing that uh, record with Blue Note with Greg. And um Wow, time flies. That was like 15 years ago. Mm. So, but anyway, after that, I decided to leave Manhattan School of Music and, you know, pursue it really full time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Nice. We're going to conclude with a, a little fun section I call Turn Up Mute. All right. All right. I'm going to give you two options. Okay. And uh, of anything, it could be music, it could mm -hmm. be cities, it could be food type mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> the one which whatever you're feeling at the moment you turn it up the other one you turn it down or you, you mute it but the caveat is that whatever you turn up or whatever you mute it doesn't mean that you don't care for it it just means that at this point in time yeah the one you turned up you're feeling it yeah okay and do you want me to say why oh or, yeah yeah you can okay. say whatever you can say got why it, got yeah. it. turn up mute yeah turn up and mute okay okay Jay-Z, Nas. Which one to turn up and yeah. which one to mute? Yes. Or like both? No, no, you can only one. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, well, it's hard. I would say turn up Jay-Z, but okay. I'm biased because yeah, yeah, I'm know, in Jay's right. video. <laughs> and there was, you know, we've sat together and, you know... There was okay. one night uh, I was hanging with my. Uh, it's a it's a poor question of my. Um, but go ahead. Go I know ahead. you yeah, kind yeah. of set me up with that yeah. one. But there's an interesting story too here. So one of my uh, musical colleagues, Jerry mm -hmm. Wonder, who's mm -hmm. one of the uh, iconic super producers out there, produced the Fuji's album, the mm -hmm. Score. Uh, Wycliffe Jean mm -hmm. is his cousin, and uh, he built uh, Platinum Sound with Wycliffe Jean this amazing studio in Times Square. And uh, him and I are, have, you know, made a lot of records together. And one night we're in the studio and um, uh, Ebro from Hot 97 comes mm -hmm. by and, you know, we're all like hanging out and stuff. And, uh, you know, and, and we're, you know, he's like, yeah, I'm going to the Jerry's. Like, I'm going to this party tonight, man. You want to come? Da, 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 da. You can come if you want. I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, so it's me uh jerry and ebro and we're mm -hmm. heading downtown and we get to this party man and uh, i think it was at santos mm -hmm. and we head upstairs to the back to the vip room somebody's birthday party and we're like sitting at this table like that's about like that size yeah and it's three <laughs> of us right and the, the party's full of people mm -hmm. it's a small party but it's full so it's and, a very low table like uh maybe, yeah maybe 12 inches high. <laughs> exactly. Very low table. Yeah. And then like, boom, Beyonce just comes walking. Whoa. Comes walking in. <laughs> and uh, and then Jay-Z, boom, just comes walking in like a minute or two later. Damn. And this other woman that was with them, I think that was Beyonce's assistant. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we had a few moments together mm. at this table. It was myself. Yeah. Jerry Wonder, Ebro from Hot 97. Uh, Beyonce, Beyonce Jay Z, Jay -Z. and Beyonce's Whoa. assistant, and we were just sitting at this VIP <laughs> oh table together for a moment, just chopping interesting. It up for a so I'm bit. like, how many degrees of suppression from Beyonce? And what I don't know how to measure it, but <laughs> like, <laughs> 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 so 
<laughs> well, I will say yeah. that they're both they're both very nice and very sweet. Yeah, very cool people. Jay Z seems like a funny guy. Like mm. he's just one of those yeah. guys. It's funny. It's, like when you just casually hang out, mm-hmm. he'll just make jokes here and there. It's so just like somebody jovial. somebody bum rushed him with like yeah. some CDs and stuff. It's like you just guy just uh, that used to happen with Dame too. With mm. Dame Dash, people yeah. would see us walking down the street, and a guy would come out of nowhere. And just with, give with yeah yeah come out of nowhere with a CD in his hand actually no the, his hands behind his back and you know he's got the <laughs> CD and he just comes out and he don't even say nothing he just starts rapping and people just nod you know oh, Dame would just nod yeah. Jay Z did the same thing he's just nodding listening and listening and then as he's up and then while he's rapping he pulls out the CD starts pointing at the oh CD pointing at me says oh, pointing at him. Saying, this mm-hmm. is me and, stuff, and, stuff, and, stuff, and, oh. and he gives him the CD and he like still rapping as he walks off and, stuff, and, stuff, and the rap just yeah. fades out stuff, and stuff, and stuff, and stuff, and stuff. oh my gosh <laughs> and then Jay-Z looked over at Beyonce he was like I think she he went in too deep <laughs> oh. <laughs> my man went in too deep <laughs> do you do you think people like Jay-Z and them Dash or like Kanye mm-hmm. if somebody bum rushes them and give them CDs like that do they do you think they ever listen, or do you think in general they just? I think it's like uh, I think it's like playing the lottery. Yeah, okay. It's like a yeah. dice roll. You never know. Yeah. Sometimes you know Dame would like lose the CD. Mm. You know he would honestly misplace it. Yeah. Oh man, I forgot to see. Uh, sometimes he'll listen. Sometimes he wouldn't. Mm. You know, some. I mean, it's but just they're so. They're up generally and down. inclined to want to. To want to take a look at it or to want to take a listen? I, it's it's hard to say. The because, general inclination, yeah, they say, yeah. The, you know, but I mean, it depends. Like if, you know, sometimes if I'm having a bad day, yeah. I don't want to listen to nothing. Yeah, yeah. You know, but but just, you know that at the yeah. level where Jay-Z is now. No, everybody th- all the time is just, yeah, I can't but, even imagine. But at the same time, people yeah. like Jay-Z, I'm sure if they hear the first bar, they can tell if this person is right good or not so yep wouldn't that wouldn't that motivate them to like at least take a listen for like a second i would, <laughs> you know? I would hope you so <laughs> i would hope so i don't want to discourage yeah. anybody <laughs> too you know because so. how else how else do you want people yeah to do like if you're able to be in the same vicinity with jay-z or dim dash I'm starting to think i should have rapped for jay now <laughs> I was trying to ask you, you should have been like, some bars. Hey, you know, I rap too, you know? man. You know? Man, check so, it out, man. So. What's your email address? Man? Give me your, your number. You ain't even got... Look, man, you, I ain't going to pull up my phone. You don't have to write it down. Just say the number. I'll remember it. Okay? Just tell me the number. I got you, man. My hands ain't moving. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy word out there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The next question. Okay. Um... This, maybe this question. I don't know. Ahmad Jamal, Duke Ellington. Oh, my goodness. Another tough one. That, that one's tough. Oh, jeez. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, man. Why you do that to me, man? That's yep. hard. <laughs> That's hard. I listen to your oh music over and over again. Oh, so my God. Like, okay. I'm going to get you. <laughs> yeah, you got me with that one, man. Okay. Remember I'm, I'm my caviar. To, Just what you're yeah, feeling. I know, now, I know, I know. I'm going to go. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to keep it real. I'm going to yeah. go with my gut. Yeah. My gut says to turn up on my Jamal. Okay. That's what my gut said to my do. Sorry, Duke. Yeah. I'll Maybe like, next time. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> or when you leave here. <laughs> right, when I leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When last did you listen to Ahmad's record? Well, so I, I, well, my favorite era of hip hop is like the 90s era New York. Mm-hmm. You know, so that New York sound. So, I mean, I would say I listen to more of Ahmad Jamal's work. Mm hmm in that way oh, okay more than his personal records yeah i, oh, I mean okay. i love his albums and his records and things like that but i'm mostly exposed to and connected to ahmad jamal through mm. the records that have sampled his work yeah so like uh dead presidents jay-z's dead presidents mm-hmm. or uh, nas the world is yours okay. right you mm. know so it's that sound that's that's like so like just the other day mm-hmm. 
I probably honestly I haven't listened to like an Ahmad Jamal record album in years and years and years. But uh, Nas, I was just uh, you know list that Nas record. I was just listening to the other day. Mm. You know, so mm. yeah, interesting. Mm-hmm. Say a funny story. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if it's funny. I was uh, I moved to the U.S. in 2000. I came mm-hmm. as a student, and, and uh, in 2001, there was a, a my choir uh, director. He he took me to a concert. He's like, "Oh, Ahmad Jamal is playing." I didn't wow. know who Ahmad Jamal was. <laughs> I was just, I'm just an African right. kid just came to the U- oh, <laughs> U.S. Wow. So I went and I saw Ahmad Jamal. I was so impressed. Mm. I didn't care to like continue with uh, following his work. I mean, I studied mathematics, so I mm-hmm. I was just mm-hmm. doing music and and uh, by the side, music was just like a hobby to me then. Right. But later on. This was like, um, I don't know, maybe like 2010-ish. That was when I looked back. I'm like, whoa, I went and I saw my Jamal. Right. <laughs> and yep. I totally forgot about it. Can you imagine? Wow. Because <laughs> cause I started studying his work, studying Ahmad Jamal's work, listening the way he plays some some like I, I really like the way he played Misty even though right if if you don't know Misty you probably wouldn't know that it's Misty anymore the way he right. just went in on this yeah. song you know so yeah. I was listening that period I was listening to different versions of Misty and that was when I realized oh my gosh I've seen I have I remember seeing this guy, you know. So yeah. <laughs> that that reminds me of like, you know, so many hip hop records I would hear mm-hmm. and I would love the vibe of the record, but at the same time had no idea that it was a Ma Jamal. Like mm-hmm. I didn't realize it was the same person. Yeah. And then when that veil was lifted mm-hmm. and when I when the, when I made that connection, oh my God. Hmm. I'm mm-hmm. like, I gotta know more about this well, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Mm-hmm. The last last question. All B. Right. This one have to be. Oh man, I'm, I'm nervous ten- now. <laughs> oh my god. You have to be very very attentive. This uh-huh. is between two worlds. Okay. One of Uh-oh. them is enter the garden. Mm-hmm. Another one is the magic the magic hour. Enter the garden. The magic mm. hour. Turn up. Turn up. Which one? The magic hour. Okay. These are between two of your songs. <laughs> yep, yep. And you know what? Mm-hmm. Like that one. It it the, the magic hour. That was the last track. It's the last track on the album, but mm-hmm. it was also the last one to be recorded. Mm. And that one is the only one that was completely improvised mm. from beginning to end in that in just one take. Oh, nice. So I just went in and did that. Did wow. that one. Okay. Yeah. And, so it should uh, definitely be turned up. <laughs> yeah. And actually the album, there were a few other tracks that mm-hmm. were I was considering putting on the album. And just after thinking about the sound I wanted, the impact I wanted to make, mm-hmm. the mark I wanted to leave with this album, I felt like something was missing. Something was missing. And so I started like looking at different movie scenes, you know, mm. looking at like Home Alone, you know, looking at Robin Williams movies mm-hmm. and just going through these different clips of these sti- uh, these Steven Spielberg films. Mm-hmm. And and then it just came to me, this vibe, this kind of like, mm-ba, mm-ba, this just that kind of like curiosity mm-hmm. the, the sound of wonder and exploration the sound of adventure mm-hmm. right but also something bringing closure and i said i gotta start recording right now i gotta mm. start recording right now and i just went in and just hmm. just knocked it out and after it was done i said that's it mm. that's what was missing mm. that's what was missing that's the magic hour. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Mm-hmm. Harold O'Neill, thank you for coming on Doing Jazz. And I hope we can do it again. Yeah. You don't have to have an album to come on the show. You can just 
tell me you want to just come and sure yeah share what you got with us man <laughs> yeah. thank you so much for having me here yeah. really appreciate your no vibe you. and your spirit and uh you know it was a pleasure thank you and i look forward to the next time yep <laughs> thanks yeah. thank later you. later we did it <laughs>